Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are on YouTube and you see a little link down below, you can click on it. You'll end up in Zoom. If you see a little link down below that, you can, you can also uh, click on that and you'll end up in Makana. And that's where you become actually a producer for the show. Your questions and your votes pretty much drive the entire conversation. So we really depend on you to, uh, to come in early, uh, ask those questions, uh, ask them early, vote on them early. We spend a little bit more time on the front half of the questions and the back half of the questions. And so what we spend time on and how we approach it is really uh, up to you. So, um, so, so definitely jump into Makana and uh, push that conversation along. If you think you can add to the conversation, you can actually answer those questions, um, then come in a little early. You have to be here by 6.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time to take part in the panel, uh, but you can get here as early as six. We sit and fiddle around. I think today we were talking about BGA. It's very, very important. I think I, I learned more about DBI and BGA this morning than I have in my entire lifetime. So, um, so we, we cover a lot of conversations, uh, which are which are uh, which are very interesting. But they're really there. Why we're there is to um, to actually you know work on people's kit and make sure that it's ready to go for the show. Um, at seven o'clock, of course, we have general questions, any, any questions you have about media or virtual production. And then the second hour, we spend a little extra time on something that a lot of us want to talk about. Um, so today we're going to talk about networking. A lot of us are trying to figure this all out uh, for various uh, online tools, uh, AWS, as well as our physical tools, all need networking, um, need, need a lot of uh, complex connections. And so we're going to talk, this is just a Q&A. So if you have questions about networking, throw them in there right now. And, uh, and then tomorrow we have the long day. Uh, it's going to be a little different. Uh, I know it went out this morning, but we have a little bit of a schedule change. Uh, education, of course, will still be here for, from, uh, from 8 to 10. Then 10 uh, to 11, we have, uh, um, we have Nick Justishin coming in from Drexel University. We'll be talking about MetaHuman inside of Unreal and how to get those in. Uh, due to some scheduling uh, issues that we're having on our side, we're not going to do the test kitchen today, uh, this this week, but we will be doing Mad in the Kitchen. So there'll be a little break <laughs> between 11 and, and 3. So um, so from 11 to 3 o'clock, uh, we'll have a little bit of a break. And then at 3 o'clock, we'll open up the comms for Mad in the Kitchen. Uh, Nate Hill is going to be cutting the show again, so you'll get to listen to him cut. Um, and, uh, you know, he may actually be cutting the show. We're going to test something this uh, this today about he's, he may try to log in and take control of the switcher so we're going to see how that how that goes um so we're working on that right now uh so you should you, you'll get to hear all of that um at starting at three and then at five o'clock is the actual show and then the after show sometime between six and six thirty when we finish the show we'll be talking about what worked what didn't work and getting your opinion about that it, it's it's a crazy show that you actually get to listen to and affect <laughs> the show so it's a it's a it's a different uh, different kind of show than we've seen anywhere else so, um, so hopefully you'll uh, you'll jump in and and uh, and play along. I think it's time for the questions. Bill, what do we have? Morning comes from Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas, who says it's been announced that Cisco is acquiring virtual events platform Socio Labs. Cisco also recently acquired acquired Slido, and they already own WebEx with their Meraki and transit networking footprint and their experience in voice. Could Cisco be building a true end-to-end -end play for virtual and video? And they've got links there. Discuss. Well, I think that I mean I think Cisco has they have a lot of great tools. Um, Generally, they need to provide solutions for large corporations to interact with each other and, and try to sit inside of the security requirements that Cisco is able to handle really effectively. So as a mass market solution, I'm not sure if that's really what they need uh, or, or what they're after, but as a, we can provide that solution for the corporate clients that, that need the additional security and infrastructure that Cisco provides, I think that it makes a lot of sense and it's an easy uh, investment for them. Um, I think that the fundamental competitive problem for them to become anything that would be public facing is that WebEx is about two generations behind everything else. So, so I think that that's the, you know, that I don't think that they can overcome that to become a public platform, but I don't think they need to. Uh, go ahead, Bill, and then Aaron. I've been surprised. Um, I, for me, the WebEx experience was the worst thing that I dealt with in the past couple of years. But just recently, particularly during some of the Apple presentations that I, uh, those ones at like virtual conferences, they've been using a branded form of WebEx, which surprised me. I mean, why is a company who's uh, obviously a technological leader using something that doesn't work real well? Now we're starting to see them 
maybe understanding some of this back end stuff and maybe, and this is pure speculation, WebEx will have a bit of a resurgence. It was an awful experience for me the last couple of times I used it. If they can come back that far, good on them. More competition, I guess, is better. I'd be blown away. It's possible. I'd be blown away if they became competitive. It just it just has to do with the the inertia of 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 it. You have to kind of um, you, you're limited to the the code structure that you have because a lot of companies don't want to change it either. You know, it's not like they want you to keep on innovating uh, when when they're in a large corporation like that. They want it to be the same way that it was. So it's very hard to do that, but it's possible. Aaron, Cisco has a lot of problems. They have a lot of existential problems with the cloud, um, as well as. Um, Making sure that, uh, what was I going to say? Making sure that people are um, upgrading. They don't upgrade. So you end up with people running five-year-old versions of WebEx all over the place, and they're horrible. While the current version might be fine. I mean, fine. It's still behind, but it's better than a the old stuff. The actual video quality um, of WebEx has gotten much better in the last year. Um, yes. the, the interface is just a you know train wreck. All right, next next question. Moving on, Charles Silverman in Ridgefield, Connecticut is up next with what is currently the best Mac application for nonlinear media playback for a live show or event? Best, best playback. Go ahead, Beju. Yeah, for Mac, there are quite a few options. I'm a little more partial to MITI, as you are aware, because it's pretty simple to use and you can do set it to automate or jump back and forth. Another option, if you want to do really non-linear and layered layer based playback is Arena, because you can actually set up parallel tracks so you can play the whole stack at one time or just one part of the video or swap it out. So Arena is good for that. It's cross-platform, so you can run it on Mac and PC. Millennium is there, but it's more designed for sequence-based playback. So it's more for, it would work better for scripted, I think, compared to Meteor Arena. And you also have QLab, which you can do both as well. And of course there's, uh... Resolume is another another one that you know, so that's Arena Resolume Arena. Oh, Arena. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I think of it as Resolume. Yeah. Now, now I see it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> we just call it Resolume. So it, it's it's. A, but I don't have to use it. So obviously, I would call it Arena if I if I knew what that was. So, um, yeah, the one that we've used the most is QLab, uh, and then I think MIDI is the simplest one that just does playback and and a um, little more cost effective. But QLab is, I think, the most feature rich, um, in my opinion, so far. Go ahead, Beishu. Yeah, the only issue I have with QLab is it doesn't lock the outputs to black. So if you're not careful about the desktop behind it, you can accidentally get something showing up there, which a lot of the other softwares let, it, let you lock that output out, like MITI does, or Arena does, so Resolume does. Yeah. Uh, the fact that QLab can play two videos at the same time terrifies me. I just wish that there was some way to say, I'm only going to play one thing at a time. It's, it is the thing that keeps us from you letting like an average person just run it. Someone really has to know QLab or we won't let them use it in a program because they can, and it's, it's mostly not a video popping out the wrong way. It's the audio from that video popping out that, that worries us. And so, um, so that's been the, the number one fear factor that we have around QLab is specifically being able to play more than one thing at a time. Um, but, uh, and that's what we didn't have to worry about with Playback Pro. Playback Pro was nice because the interface was super simple. Unfortunately, they were unable to keep up with the uh, OS changing. They had done a lot of hard coding in Playback, and they paid a heavy price for it. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I was going to say, I thought there was the big one in House of Worship stuff, and I think that was Playback Pro. And Presenter Pro. Presenter, Presenter Pro, Pro is, is, is kind of an all-purpose. It, it's not a yeah. pure playback system. It basically does everything you need for a worship service. Uh, and, 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 and also, they've kind of expanded into events, but... Um, it's not a pure playback system. It does do playback and even key fill outputs. So it's use useful there. Go ahead, Jonas. Um, Pro Presenter just, I'm not sure when they released it, but they have a dedicated video play out now. Oh, do they? Multi screens. So okay. maybe look into that if you uh, already that, yeah. know Pro Presenter. Absolutely. Next question. Eric Price in Levin with Kansas says, after your group project on the Playout B two months ago, do any of the panel have any observations after hopefully using it for a while? So real world testing results? I'm working on basically incorporating into a bunch of the super source stuff that we've been working on. Um, I, I, at first I thought, oh, I'll just use it for loops and everything else. But for super source loops, it, it, 
it's been working really well in my little tests at my home. And so hopefully you'll see it soon uh, looping because it's just a great, great cost effective way for me to sit there and just have little things that aren't, I, you know, I had issues with, you know, big playback with lots of graphics and seeing some things that were limitations of the Raspberry Pi. Um, but with, you know, subtly looping things that normally would take up a, some kind of media player or some, you know, things that you just go, oh, that, I don't really want to tie up a play out with that. It's great. Um, also, you know, uh, graphics. I mean, I'm right now I'm trying to figure out, I've been looking at, there's Raspberry Pi rack mounts. So I'm actually looking at putting, you know, 10 or 12 Raspberry, uh, play out bees into the system so that I just have all these things that I can cut to because I have a limited number in my media player uh, on a, on a constellation, but I have 40, uh, you know, inputs. <laughs> so I can just, I, I'm looking at literally having 10 or 12 of those inputs be different loops of things that I want to use. And the least expensive way to do it is with play out B. So that's what I'm kind of working towards slowly. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Um, I just wanted to confirm uh, play out bees can play out things at different frame rates. Can they, can they do one from frame a second countdowns and stuff like that? Um, or is it, or, or is it a fixed frame rate? I have tested. I think you sent me a file with one uh, frame per second countdown, and they were. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to check with that. What what I found was the compressor's output doesn't work, but weirdly enough, um, handbrakes one frame yeah. per second conversion I worked. I put it into so, yeah. handbrake, then it worked for some reason, and it, yeah, but it doesn't really care about frame rate and even resolution. It just uh, plays it. Yeah, interesting. And go ahead, Courtney. Sorry, I covered up my mute button. How many, can you only control two of them from the uh, ATEM software as HyperDex? Up to four, I think, yeah. Okay, thanks. And for me, I'm not worried about that because I'm just going to open them up on a web page and because they're all loops of things that I want to, to use. And so I just would see them populate a whole multi-view of, of all the loops that I might want to use um, inside of a system. Uh, next question. Sure. Uh, Tony Mobley of Newman, Georgia, our longtime friend here on the show, says, after 13 months of constant use, my $10 pile mic is failing. Oh, my gosh. Should I purchase a new one or up my game? My budget could handle up to $150 for a new mic, and he wants to use it with an ATEM Mini Pro. I will say, Tony, you, you're one of those, you know, you have, you have the voice that can wear any clothes at once, you know, like, you know, so, so the thing is, is that you, you know, you, you have a great voice. You can get away with a, a $15 mic and, 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 and you could probably be, you'd probably be fine. Uh, I don't think you need, you need to go up uh, any, any higher. If you wanted to get, if you want to go to hundred fifty dollars, I think a Yeti mic might, might be really great. If you want another uh, headset mic, I don't think it, they get much better. I don't think they improve dramatically from the $15 Pulsons or $20 Pulsons to um, a countryman. I think there's like a, there's no, nothing in the between that I've heard that I go, oh, that's significantly better than a Pulson. Um, you know, so I, I, we've kind of moved internally to Pulsons over, over the piles. The fit for us is a little better. I will say the Pulson fits tighter than the pile. And so if your head is a little larger, um, since we haven't met in person, I don't know, but if your head is a little larger then you may want to go with the pile instead of the Pulson, uh, go ahead, Sky. Well, and Alec, to your, to your point of, 10 months ago, we had a concept that you couldn't see the mic in your shot, but now that aesthetic has changed. And so um, maybe he doesn't need to have a headset mic because he's not flailing about and doing his conversation. He's having uh, communication over the internet. So maybe rethink the type of mic, not just uh, replacing of that uh, yeah. specific thing. And once you go to that, then you're talking about um, either the you know, the SM7V or B, or you have the uh, PR40, which a lot of us use. Um, so those are all things that are a little bit more expensive than $150. Um, but those are those are some other options, I think. Um, so yeah, things to think about there. Yeah. SM58? Um, SM58 might be might be okay. I, I think an SM58 is totally solid. I, I think yeah. that the presence of it is not as good. And I, um, when I play my voice back there, I, I, it's sometimes a not as not as much headroom as I'd like. You know, in the four K to eight K range, I feel like there's a little drop off there that I'm not as happy with. Um, but go you ahead, always Courtney. have an extra hammer there. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Or you could just buy ten Pulsons and use them like Kleenex. You know, when one dies, exactly. You just keep changing. It on. Yeah, exactly. We we send out two, oftentimes just to make sure because sometimes the failure rate's a little higher. So we just send two mics out. We're like a uh, Tommy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I go along with it. I just get another pulse in and save up a little bit until you can get a really nice mic. Yeah. You were going to say, Mickey? Yeah, I agree. Like, um, even if you go with an SM58, which is 90 to 100 US, you'd still need an interface to go with that. So that's another 100 US on top of that. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say earlier, someone needs to make a, a pulse and dispenser. And I think... <laughs> I think uh, Alex would be the perfect person. Yeah, there we go. Pulse and dispenser. Okay. <laughs> Case question. of no audio break class. Uh, we're moving on to another Tony Mobley question here from Newman, Georgia. Is there a good use case for the new iPad Pro 12.9 inch as a display, maybe using Sidecar? Would that be the best way to use it? Or are there other suggestions? And there's an attached note. Can you use Thunderbolt 4 to connect the iPad as a display? Charles. <laughs> threw the ball the receiver didn't even turn around i just threw the ball right down the field yeah <laughs> we are gonna find out very very soon uh both alex and i received our shipped message so uh hopefully they will come in before next friday which will be awesome um that is the first plan is actually to use it in sidecar mode um but as soon as we have it in hand we'll be able to tell if we connected do we get a better signal is there any latency does that even matter um one of the other uses that i want to try is next time i'm on set i want to rig it next to the camera i want to yeah. see what i'm getting um if um, um in the past we've used them to give out to clients on larger sets with more budget so we'll get a bunch of ipad pros and Everybody that's highfalutin gets a gets an iPad and they walk around telling people what to do. Um, uh, but for us, being able to view HDR a thousand nits like full screen um, in P3 on that device um, with an M1 chip, it's actually going to be great. Um, I believe just in the next few months, the use cases for it, as soon as people have it in their hands, it's going to expand very quickly. Um, but those are the first ones that we're going to try out. Yeah. As soon as we confirm that Charles is, is, uh, successful that, that, you know, when he says, oh, it's 60% of a Flanders or 80% or 90%, as soon as we feel like it's a reasonable, um, you know, connection to that, I think that we may be supplying some of our clients with, or, or at least encouraging them to have it at home to make sure that we're all looking at the same thing. I mean, that's the real power of this is that for a relatively inexpensive cost, uh, we can ensure that everyone's basically looking at the same image, um, which is a really interesting, we've never had that before. <laughs> We're always talking about, oh, this looks this way and this looks this way. And this. so if you think about four or five decision makers somewhere in the world, all with the same device, able to talk about reds or greens or, or something like that, it's a much, much different thing uh, than, than what we've had in the past. So we're, we're pretty excited. Um, next question. All right, Cochran here in the panel from Seattle, Washington. Is uh, There is a 150,000 person virtual event going on today that some folks in this group are working on. LED wall applause mode shows zoom gallery view with flashy lights coming in from behind. Can we take a look and analyze and guy has it hooked up and I think that's what we're seeing right now. So that's a pretty big wall. So here's the wall and then it was at 140. So let me jump ahead to 140 get it right about here so here's more of a close-up and somewhere here in the uh, next 20 so I'm, seconds i'm glad that there's Go some depth of field talk, yeah so i'm glad that i'm glad that they have a little bit of depth of field i always think it's funny when people put muffs on people's uh headsets when they're inside like it's it's always like why did we do that <laughs> so anyway yeah, i'm sorry it so it's just, it's just like it's, it's, it's about matching funny. hair color well, I just, it's just like, it, I just never understand it. Like there's no wind. So, um, so anyway, uh, so that's, um, Ooh, effects. Well, I, yeah. I think sometimes like in, in these events, they like run around and jump around and that might be the reason why they would, they're being extra safe and with, uh, with the wind noise. Go ahead, Charles. It could be. Are you going to say something, Charles? Yes, I actually um, um, I actually watched some of this yesterday in the last couple of days. It's a five-day event, uh, so I actually signed up for it because I wanted to see both what our friend is doing and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's a good YouTube? message. Or is that? Um, they send you a link to a YouTube live feed, but I don't know if it's 
if you can just find it on YouTube, I'm not exactly mm. sure. But the production at any given time that I've looked at it randomly, because it is long, um, it's always been spot on. Like I haven't seen any issues with it. So Very cool. Now go ahead, Aaron. How are they syncing the lights with the video, the whole applause thing? Is it a synchronized thing or is it just somebody hitting buttons? Or do you I'm not know? sure, but I, I just quick in vMix, I just keyed out that, you know, those lines in between gallery. If you look at gallery view, it has like kind of a milky or black, like a yeah. maybe 95% or you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So I'm able to key out here just roughly. I just hit it real fast with, I just took the eyedropper in vMix and touched it. So what you're seeing here is, uh, you know, our, and our gallery view. If you don't change the, if, if you know that the screen is going to be full and you you can easily set up a, a transparency mask where you wouldn't have to key anything, you know, so you, you could just simply, um, cause these, if, if the, if you don't change the monitor size, the number of, um, panes remain stable. So it would be easy for them if they wanted to, to actually just have just to cut people out. If but they know that that first screen is going to be full. Sorry for interrupting. Those effects are going on top of the video as well. So maybe they're mixing them in, in the background and on top. Yeah. The software I heard they're using, called Disguise. Yeah, they're using Disguise Media Server. So they probably have the timeline stacked in there. Basically, they have the layer for the Zoom videos and they have the effects layers either on top or bottom as they need it, basically. Yeah. Disguise lets you do a lot of processing on it pretty easily. I, uh... I, I don't know what I, I I'd have a hard it's it's not it's not my taste. So I think I think that I think that, that would be accurate. It, it's I, don't I don't like things behind life. people. I don't like things moving behind people. I, I will admit that I don't like lots of stuff behind people. I think that's my um like lots of moving things. And and I think this is as of someone who's a little bit ADD, it's very, very hard for it's you know, just my brain does not process what we're looking at very well. And so I know that for me, I would turn it off. Like I would never pay to watch something with all those people behind it. I think if, you know, and, and what's interesting is, is that I have built systems where I put people behind it. There's something about people with natural lighting that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I think it's very warm. It's the video lighting behind them that, that I've noticed in some of these that bothers me a lot. Um, and I will not say that that's the truth or that that is how it should be. I'm just saying that my reaction when I look at it is, uh, it, creates kind of a um, panic condition or race condition for my brain. So I'm, you know, it's not something that I would want to want to watch for very long. Um, go ahead, Sky. I'm just curious why they chose Las Vegas. I mean, I, there's many obvious reasons, but I'd be curious. Because there's a company out. that does it, GoPro. There's a company that, that is got a big studio that's designed to do this in Las Vegas. That's I mean, that's answer. why, that's why it's there is because they built it there. And I think they built it there. They, I think the building there of that location was happening before COVID. Yeah. So it's just that there's a you know there's a large facility there that's designed for this one thing. Go ahead, Charles. I was actually feeling a similar way to Alex. Um, and the one thing that I was thinking was uh one way to separate the background from them, because if you just turn that screen um to a black and white, your focus doesn't go to the speaker because the contrast is part of the image is actually the background. Um, what I would have probably done is uh, washed the background a little bluer and brought down the highlights to mm -hmm. to maybe 60%. So naturally, the highest peak is the person speaking because that's how our brains tend to associate and attract. Um, I think that would help a lot because I agree with Alex. You know, like I tend to, I mean, I'm listening to what they're saying but I'm looking to what everybody in the background is doing under a little square. There were a couple shots there I saw with like a short depth of field that I was like, oh, that's not that bad. And as soon as they cut to the wide, and especially when they cut to all the lighting effects, I was like, oh, I would, I would immediately turn that off. Like, I just can't, you know, and I, and I, and I will admit that I, as, as we all know from, from our little get together here, um, I tend to appreciate a more cerebral conversation and less jumping up and down. Like, you know, so, um, so I'm, it's, I will admit that I'm probably not the target audience for, for this type of thing. Um, I was never one, I was always one of those people when they, when they said, okay, now let's all jump up and down, like at a, at a, like some event or something like that. I would just sit in my chair and just go, okay, when are we going to finish this? You know? So, you know, like, and let's get back to the conversation. So, so I admit I'm probably not the target, uh, Bill. 
I, and I think that's the point. Uh, you know, I can enjoy sitting in a stage play from Chekhov that's moody and dark. I can also enjoy going to a carnival with the kids, which is over the top and everything from smells to sights to sounds. And so I think a lot of people oscillate between those two poles, depending on what they're in the mood for. And there are markets for both. So yep. no, I agree. Both. I agree. Absolutely. Um, next question. Tony Mobley in Newman, Georgia, back again with uh, with Mickey doing Clubhouse during the Office Hours show. Has there been an uptake in listeners now that and excuse me that Android is live for Clubhouse? I don't know, Mickey. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's funny that uh, Tony asks that today. That uh, I wasn't able to set up the club, Clubhouse feed because I was validating comms. Um, uh, for the past few months, uh, three has been a huge party at Clubhouse, at least for the <laughs> office hours stream. <laughs> very yeah. exclusive party. Yeah, it's a very exclusive party. People, yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the best, and we haven't promoted it, to be fair. We haven't really promoted the yeah. Clubhouse thing. It's been mostly testing the, the pipeline. So, but um, yeah, it, it feels like, <laughs> it feels like it's popularity. I don't think that Android's going to save it. I think that it's, its popularity is dropping pretty quickly. So um, and I think that it fundamentally it has they have some assumptions that the idea I, I I can only guess because they put in tons of features without putting in people being able to submit test text questions that unless that changes, you know, it just create they won't know why it's not working. But people who create events, I mean, I, I pop into those events every once in a while, like, oh, how's Clubhouse doing? And I listen to it and then they open a mic and people have bad audio and they give rambling questions and they do all the things that that you know, those of us who do events know is what's going to happen. And it makes it just, it just, you just go, okay, I don't need to listen to this anymore. And so I think that that's the, that's the fundamental problem and, and they could fix it, but it may be too late. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah. And I've noticed that as well, like with uh, my, my circles outside of office hours, because like, office hours were a bunch of, um, I think uh, we, try, we like to test things a lot. Um, but even with my circles for, that are less uh, techy, uh back in february you know i had a, a couple of people uh that that i see join rooms but nowadays it's like not so much not yeah. maybe maybe a one twentieth of of the number of people that that were there back in february it, there's more than just giving everybody audio you know like this is the problem that hangouts had um is that they uh hangouts wanted to make it easy for everyone to do live conversations and stream to the to the internet. It's just that there's not that many people that are good at it. And so they, and, and if people have enough bad experiences, they just go, oh, I don't, I don't, the, the whole platform becomes less, less valuable. Um, next question. Brian Carpenter, Cleveland, Ohio is up next. Is it possible to get a microphone chain that can be 12 inches from my mouth to be off camera, yet rejects nominal ambient sounds like central HVAC keyboards and so forth? My peers associate a microphone in the Zoom frame as a disc jockey wannabe, like a head-worn mic will attract Janet Jackson and Brittany comments as well. So he's trying to do, he's trying to fight physics here. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, perhaps what I would I would suggest would be a uh, a cardioid or hypercardioid a uh, small diaphragm condenser microphone, uh, something like an Octava uh, MK12, which is around I, I think the 200 US, and the uh, maybe the Shure SM81, which is uh, around I think 300 or 350 US. Go ahead, David. Yeah, there's some um, sure hypercardioid. That's a very nice uh, mic for that distance. Carl, and keep it, keep in mind. Oh, sorry. Okay. So pretty much, if you if you're price conscious, just look for anything that's low bar. So L O B A R. Um, as far as getting keyboard rejection, because that's going to be pretty close to you. Um, if you because if you're going to point it down towards you, you're going to pick up stuff like keyboard. If you point it up to you, then the mic's going to be closer to the keyboard. So either way, you, you're not going to win there. But yeah, just do a Google search on low bar microphones. I'm um, Sennheiser, sure, they will do them. That's your best choice for something that's more than a foot away from you and you want to reject everything else around. Uh, Mickey? And yeah, uh, work with a, with, with a polar pattern as well. If you, if you go with a cardioid or hypercardioid, point the null away away from the source of the noise. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the side where you adjust it towards your mouth. Courtney? 
And if you go with a uh, cardioid large diaphragm condenser, like the one I have here, it's just out of frame, it can be uh, out of frame and still just about six inches from your mouth as long as you're not you know, very far away. And the null of the microphone is pointed toward my keyboard. So um, the ratio of noise, like the fan that just came on, is less. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, and also remember that directionality in microphones tend to be something that works in the mid and upper ranges. Low frequency bass is omnipresent everywhere. And if you've got a jackhammer in the neighborhood, nothing's going to be directional. And just don't get too caught up in fashion. <laughs> That's what I would say, you know, like, like, you know, the, uh, you know, people wear monkey suits with stupid ties that don't make any sense. Like the tie has no use at all, but people still do it because it's become some kind of social constraint um to to what they what they have to wear so that they fit in um and so people do a lot of stupid things to fill it and fit in you know suits and ties are one of those stupid things um and so so you don't want to you, you know i still wear it i'm saying stupid and when i wear it i think how stupid this is like i'm putting the thing around my neck that has no 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 value at all um so so we all know that we we, we will f choose times to f fit in but we also don't have to feel like we have to um you know especially when it's improving quality it's not being it's not not fitting in to do something or have some statement, but it actually improves the way people hear you. So, so I, I, uh, um, anyway, so I, I'd say be proud of your mic. <laughs> All right. Next question. Tony Mobley back from Newman with how many panelists are using a three-year-old or newer Apple watch? A couple of us. Mine is three years. And so it's, I haven't, I haven't upgraded for two, two watches. Um, I'm going to probably upgrade the next one. You know, like it's my battery starting to wane. Um, Charles. Yeah, I, I had the first one. The only reason why I stopped using that one was because the glass front was starting to actually decouple Come off. Yeah. And at the same time they came out with what I have now, which is about three years old. And it's when they started to, uh, track your resting heart rate. And, right. and for me training, like, that's just a great value. Yep. So anyone else have a, yeah, mine, I, I, I got it. The resting heart rate was the thing that well, I, I was mostly interested in. And so I got that one, um, for r roughly the same reason. And then, uh, and, and, and now I'm just ready for a new one as of the battery's not, not going as well as it used to. And so it's probably time to, to upgrade. Then I have to give it, my wife doesn't wear a watch, but I have to give her one of the watches so she can turn Apple fitness on. And then you can stop wearing it again. You can't get it working on your account without the watch. So you just need to pair up with the watch and make it yours and then turn it on and then you're off to the races. Go ahead, Aaron. I tend to just upgrade all of my Apple devices about once every two or three years. Um, yeah. With the exception of the phone, I get that every couple of years. But yeah. the, yeah, so it, it, it came with the iPad Pro that I have and the um, and the MacBook Pro that I have. And right. yeah, absolutely. And probably later this year, I'll buy another one. Next question. Tony's back with a lot of questions today. He has two more in the panel that have been voted way up. So legitimately, the people find them popular. At this time, should I purchase an iPhone? Oh, no, we just did that. No, no. This, yeah. Yep, yep. Should I purchase an iPhone 12 Pro Max or wait for the iPhone 13 Pro Max or maybe the uh, mythical high-end iPhone M1, which should be coming someday? Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, this question always comes up of when to upgrade. It's, um, I, I follow Rene, um, Rene's advice. It's, you know, when you need one to do it, because there's always something new coming out next year. Otherwise, you would, you would, you'd always I, wait. Given that we know that they come out every year, w once I get past December, I won't upgrade. <laughs> like, 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 if I get past December, I won't buy another phone because I, you know, I'm just going to wait for the new one. I'll live with what I have. And the one that I use actually every day. So I have a couple 12s that I do tests with, and I have my office phone is at 11. But I use a 10 on it on a daily basis. It's mostly just because I haven't had time to move it and it's big and I, it's all I have a case for it. I'm just very comfortable with it. So I don't feel the need, you know, to to have a uh, um, to have a higher end phone. Uh, I need I need the steps to I need the, the new ones to test. Um, but it hasn't been it hasn't really impacted me that much. The only time I notice it is when I need to do LIDAR. I have to grab one of my test phones to, to do that. So um, uh, so I, I don't think I think unless you have a really, really old phone or unless you broke your phone, I would not get anything until September. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. 
And we don't even know if there's going to be an iPhone 13 because they might lock out all those triskaidectaphobics out there who don't want something with a 13 on it. Oh, <laughs> it might be. Yeah, it might be the 14. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It could. It could be an iPhone 14 or a, some kind of a whole new nar- naming architecture. Uh, yeah, that, that that would be. That's interesting. I never thought of that. Yeah, the, the, other, the other real thing will be to see supply constraint. Um, the word is that the supply constraint for electronics, specifically FPGA, is dire. Um, so, if you're, by the way, if you're going to upgrade your studio, this is the time to do it. Uh, they're talking about you know, FPA gel- delays that are now have been increased by 10 to 12 times what they were before. So, um, and this is across the board. So it is uh, 52 weeks to get uh, high end FPGAs from Intel yeah. right now. Instead of two. Like it's, yeah. it, you know, like it, and, and um, there's manufacturers that are talking about not having anything to sell, not being able to make anything by September. So um, it's, it's getting pretty intense. So we'll see how Apple fares. They have the money to usually get over top of that, but it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens with the phones. Next question. Tony Mobley's back with thoughts about Apple Fitness Plus and AR, mixed reality glass. And he's talking about Apple glasses in part, if they ever materialize. There's a huge opportunity. I mean, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I think Apple is definitely taking the lead in what is slowly becoming one of the biggest aspects of everybody's life. And um, as far as well-being and taking care of yourself and being conscious, Apple has always taken the conscious approach to whatever they do that is thoughtful. I think they are pushing so hard at it. And from what I've seen from the Apple Fitness, they're taking it very seriously. Uh, the production quality is amazing. The trainers that I've seen is amazing. And the way that they're tying it in to all of their devices, they're doing the Apple thing where they make everything you touch interact with each other, making your life so you don't have to think about it. It's there for you. Mm-hmm. Like I love my Apple Watch. I love the fact that I see my resting heart rate. I know today, for example, I trained Lex last night. My heart rate is about 49 this morning, so it's a little high for me. So I know that I'm going to take the day off and relax, but I get that same information on my laptop, on my uh, phone. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with their AR. Um, I wonder how they're going to approach it. I'm sure whichever way they do, it will set a trend. So I'm looking forward to that. Go ahead, David. Yeah, you always want to do the Gretzky thing with Apple. You want to see where they're going. And uh, you can see that the AR work on the phone is really amazing. You know, the IKEA apps and the virtual reality apps that enhance overlay into the AR. And the real key will be that when Apple brings out a pair of glasses that can uh, overlay fitness information or, you know, meta information just out of your peripheral, that's really going to be the game changer. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Mark, and then Alex. Yeah, to Charles's point, um, the fitness element is the reason why I finally decided to get a, uh, an Apple Watch in January. I wanted to lose weight. I wanted to get healthy. The three rings that I use every day to kind of measure my progress and set goals, and most importantly was the cardio fitness more than anything else. I wanted that. I was really interested in the VO2 max measurement, So, um, and it's made a big, big impact on my life. I think there's a lot of, I mean, we've been doing tests on and off. It's one of the reasons. So the most reason I had a motion capture system is that we built exercise motion capture with experts um, out of a, I can't, I don't think I can mention the company, but they're like a secret company that works with athletes to um, improve their capacity for mostly for um, combine and for, you know, teams and so on and so forth. And so they uh, have these incredible, um, uh, they have incredible fitness experts. And so we did 400 motions from motion capture where you would they would show you exactly. And they were like literally paying attention to your back angle and your leg angle and everything else of exactly how to get the maximum out of every exercise. And so it was it was done for an app that um, that basically you could it would you would build your exercise routine and then it would show you you'd watch little videos on how to do it. And the problem we really had was that we we're still rendering it out. We didn't have AR. We didn't have real time in in the um, to to show you how to do that. You had to watch a little video from one angle. Now, you know what I see is that there'll be exercises where we we have those motions um, that are all there, and you can, like I say, it can design your your workout 
and show you a person at scale in front of you doing it. And then you can walk around them if you're not clear of exactly how to do that exercise. If you start tying that back into, and, and that could work for a lot of things, whether it's exercise or martial arts or lots of other things where you can learn those moves. And a lot of times that single angle that we, you know, we had, I grew up <laughs> with martial arts books with like from one angle of like here and then here and then here, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, now you have, you could walk around someone doing a kata, you know, and, and be able to, you know, learn, learn that piece. Um, at some point you could get to a point where it puts your video back over top of it, or even a 3d representation of you over top of the mo motion or near the motion so that you can see yourself next to it. So that's another, you know, piece of that, of that puzzle, um, that, that would be possible. And then if it starts to tie into your hardware, it means that you could do things like, um, you could have a weight training program where it knows what your, it looks at how you did the last set and decides how many reps and what weight. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to put another 45 on or another 25 on or 10. It just increases or decreases that based on what it, uh, based on not only how many reps you did, but how you did them um, and makes that decision. And it, and it can constantly be moving. Like you, you could get to a point where you don't have to know that I'm doing, you know, back buys and legs on one day and chest tries and you know like the you know push and pull it, it would just be able to mix those up as needed constantly creating uh, muscle confusion and you know constantly moving those around a lot of us get into ruts when we don't well, you know because we do what we know as opposed to constantly being able, so the ability to to both track and educate someone on how to do the proper motion is lethal like it's just you know and so um, it, it's, it's really going to be an interesting thing as they start to tie all these pieces together. Go ahead, uh, Charles, and then, and then Mark, and then we'll move on. We got to start moving fast. I actually completely agree with Alex. Um, a large reason why people get a trainer is because they're, they don't know. And your form is the most important thing when you're doing a workout. So for it to be able to give you that information and also it takes a certain amount of time for your body parts to recover from a workout. So like Alex said, if you trained legs yesterday, you might take the day off today, or you'll do upper body to at least give your body some time to recover so you don't overtrain. And and that knowledge for the longest time was used by Olympians, mm -hmm. you know, where you train based on how you, well you've recovered. Well, and but now it's getting out to the public. And also, and also uh, when you eat, how you eat, what you eat, all those things can be integrated into your fitness program. So you can get into something that only folks at a high performance facility would, would have access to um, on your phone. And, and we're not, we're probably a year or two away from that, that eventuality. Go ahead, Mark, and then pretty quick and then we'll move on. Really, really quick. Um, to your point about motion, that, that point about motion, another thing that attracted me about the Apple Watch was that if I should fall and I can't get up, so to speak, um, there are people who could be alerted. And I've had some nasty falls over the years and some chest pain concerns. So that was another reason why I was interested in the watch. <laughs> if I get up. If I get my bench stuck on my chest, I need it to be. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stuck and I can't. I can't. Yeah, you can't get it off. All right. All right. That's why I don't put any clips on the end to see rock it one way and let go. And it just goes. Um, next question. Rupert McRae, Dallas, Texas is up next with Genki, G-E-N-K-I, makes a product called Wave, a finger-worn controller for audio and video with programmable buttons, gesture detection like a Wii controller, and visual feedback. It can control anything from Zoom, from uh, DAWs to MIDI. Thoughts? Anyone seen this or anything like it? Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Todd. Rupert, yeah, I, I will be happy to share about this a little bit. I, I hope I'll, I'll try to compress this answer. Dan Tepfer is a friend of mine who's also worked very much in the low latency uh, world and been very successful. Uh, I'm going to put a link in Mukana to his weekly Facebook stream to a particular one where he actually does it. It's one hour in. I'll make sure to make that uh, clear. But yeah, he's been playing with uh, also with Christian McBride with no latency across the wires. So he, he does this very artful thing where he uses processing, a program uh, to program his visuals, and then uh, Super Collider, uh, a synthesis program uh, that he uses to, uh, to do his, his audio. So that's one person. And then the next person, uh, another product is called Mujik, and it has not quite come to market yet, uh, but it is coming to market very soon. It's a violinist named, named Mari Kimura. I'll just show you this uh, this website right here, and I'll put that in Mukana as well. And she's actually using it with dancers as well. And this is a glove. 
Uh, and of course, Imogen Heap is is the one who's made all the big big work uh, in this uh, in collusion with MIT. So those are the things they're there. There's also the Mio armband, which is now defunct, that one of my former students used for quite a while. So yes, they're out there. They work, um, and that's I guess what I have to say about it for now. Todd, Todd Reynolds has arrived <laughs> on the panel. All right, <laughs> great answer. Go ahead, Carl. <laughs> So yeah, I see these used a lot for um, synthesizers. So you're controlling mm -hmm. dynamics, controlling modulation, um, yeah. especially I'm starting to see them now used in modular because you can do MIDI into a modular now. So you can do some pretty crazy stuff because it you know uses the accelerometer in the ring and you can actually have one way to be, let's say LFO and one way to be, you know, an envelope. So pretty crazy. Now do you do it much with the music that you create? Do you use any, any of those kind of reactive tools? Um, not, not the ring based ones. Mm -hmm. um, there is a headband one, which is quite interesting that I've seen. I wouldn't mind trying out. It's all that on Kickstarter. So essentially, it's just an accelerometer in a headband. But yeah, yeah. I've seen the glasses to it as well. So you can actually nod your head and set the tempo for your delay. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. All right, next question. Alex Davis of Asheville, North Carolina, I believe. I'd like to host a live music performance stream with three user-selectable audio streams, three different pianos. I want users to be able to mute solo between these three streams. Is there any way that I could achieve this on any of the live streaming platforms? And he notes, I know that YouTube used to have a user-selectable camera arrangement, wondering if that would be a lead to what I'm looking for. Carl? So there's another little question here. If there's three people are coming in from three different locations, getting them synced up is going to be a little bit hard. But if the three people are in the same location, then you can kind of roll your own in a HTTP kind of setup. So what you want is HLS. And you'll have to build a custom player that can actually, or you'll have to use a custom player to actually be able to receive it. The reason you need to get them all back, and to Carl's point, you need to get them synced first. So they, they can't come from multiple locations and stay synced, but they could come if, into one location, and then you could put them basically on three tracks. So then you have your video, and you have the three tracks that are synced both to each other and to the video. Um, you'd have to get that all kind of lined up. Then you push that into your encoder, and then essentially what you're doing is you're creating the packets, you know, the segments. We've talked about HLS in the past, but it's creating all those segments together. So it would create a... Uh, video segment as well as the audio segments and those segments will be delivered to the player at the same time with a manifest the manifest is simply a um, a document that's going to say you know this is these are the things that you have available to you as a player once you get to that that player could decide to play one track two tracks three tracks it's not something that comes out of the box on any on any platform but an hls player so you could do something like js player or something like that and build that out as a feature where you could turn on multiple um audio streams, you know, within that player, and it would just play them all, um, rather than only playing one of them. But the HLS um, or Dash solution would be the be the right one for that. But you have to be able to get it all back into one place synced and then and then come in as yeah, unified segments. Um, next question comes from oh, sorry, Aaron. Courtney, did you have oh. I, I missed you? I was just gonna suggest. Uh, I don't know if it would work. But uh, you could use maybe SAP second audio channel to send your third track and just use existing architecture and players so possibly play switch yeah might work um, next question aaron Huslidge of durham north carolina says i'm looking for a good quiet mic articulating arm mount for my desk what do people suggest this is good and it's quiet not inexpensive <laughs> so this is a uh this is an oc white um ultima 2 uh, mic arm underslung um, it's the best my arm I've ever had. And I've spent a lot of time avoiding buying it. I think I spent $600 to avoid spending 350. I finally broke down and bought it. It's good. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, the, um, the Heil, the L2T, the one that's uh, recommended for this, I'm, I'm impressed by it considering the weight of this mic and the, uh, and the shock mount that holds it really still. And my specific need was underslung so that I don't have it in front of my monitors. That's why I, I, I went that direction. Go ahead, Bill. I have the less expensive OC white. And let me see if I can cut to the wide shot. I don't know if you can see it, but it's very quiet in all aspects. It does not look anywhere near as polished and fancy. And you can see that I have all sorts of ugly cables hanging off of it, but functionally it works well. Next question. We're going to keep moving quickly. Yeah, moving on to Dave Kaufman of Vancouver, British Columbia. And Dave says, what are the panel using for monitoring their Zoom feeds? 
I am feeding the gallery to, to uh, screen one and the uh, second screen goes straight into my ATEM so that I can I could cut and do anything else and make it part of something else that I was doing. Um, goes into that and then I see that on a multi-view over here. Um, that's that's how I have mine set up anyone else. Uh, uh, real, uh, real quick and then we'll, Guy and then we'll move on. Next question. Oh, go ahead, Guy. You yeah, have a Zoom room that's over to the left. I was firing up this little uh, Lenovo um, yoga, but it was just too much work. So I quit using it. But yeah, the Zoom room over on a 27-inch Dell touchscreen. So I could pin people fast. Next question. Jesse Mills, San Francisco Bay Area. What's the poor man's way to convert SDI camera signals to NDI for testing? Blackmagic converter to black siphon to NDI siphon? Yeah, go ahead, Beju. Yeah, that works, but it's a little bit more work. And I, I don't often find black siphon can be a little bit of an issue sometimes. The easiest way might be just using OBS or vMix. Just get the capture card into it and do an NDI loop out of there. Yeah. Next question. Moving on, Abraham in San Diego. Uh, for the past week, I've been setting up a Zoom meeting, but I started using headphones and five to 10 minutes in, the audio stops working with my headphones and I can't get it to work anymore. I thought it was my PC, but last night I used my Mac mini and it did the same thing. Can anybody suggest what's going on? My headphones stopped working yesterday and I haven't been able to get them to turn back on even after a restart. I'm kind of curious if there's an answer to this. Go ahead, Carl. So if your headphones are connected to computer via USB, sometimes Bluetooth, there, there seems to be some issues at the moment with um, Zoom disconnecting for like a split second and then reconnecting back to your standard audio. I'm having headphones. trouble with all audio stopped working. So I'm thinking that it's a physical problem, but literally it was like everything was fine and then suddenly it was not right before yesterday's meeting. Um, so that's why I'm on open speakers. I'm playing you, playing all of you very low <laughs> to try to avoid any kind of echo cancellation. Um, hmm, interesting. Next question. Jesse Mills, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, running a Panasonic UE100 in high bandwidth NDI mode looks great in NDI studio monitor, but when selected as an NDI source in Zoom, the resolution is quite low. Using an enterprise account with 1080 enabled, anyone have any clues? Uh, what is the what what system is this is it pc or mac on this uh, that zoom sitting on uh windows 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 10 it sounds like somehow you're getting a proxy like if it's if it looks really low res it's decided that it and, and is it going yeah. straight just ndi and it just shows up as a source for zoom yeah that's what I, I thought it was a proxy as well but you know in zoom uh under the video selection it's you know ndi so it's it's pulling from that camera the camera is only because it can do uh full ndi and hx hx is turned off uh so it's it's pretty odd i don't know maybe the computer itself is just doing too much and um that's what i'm thinking the cpu or something have you tried it. have you tried bringing it into obs uh, no, I haven't. Or VMix. I would try to, I would see if it shows up on that same computer on a different piece of software and just, because that would tell us about the transport. It does. Yeah. It shows up in studio monitor, which is the sort of NDI generic thing. And it looks, looks good. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, and do you, have you looked at the processor? Uh, like how, have, how hard you're hitting the processor? Yeah. I'll look at that. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably the, the story. But, My um, guess is anything over 55% would cause a degradation in the video. Go ahead, Mickey. And yeah, if the uh, process, if the CPU is less than a quad core, um, then uh, the maximum it will feed out the 720p. Next question. Moving on to Locke Lopez Waterman, our friend here from New York says, what's the leanest and most reliable way to add delay uh, to your audio chain on a PC. We discussed this in the post show and I wanted to open the question to a wider group of people to discuss. Go ahead, Jeffrey. All the, uh, all the streaming softwares out there have the ability to do a delay on your, on, on your audio lines. Uh, you can do that. I always do it before it gets into the computer. Uh, so I have a mixing console that has the ability to add delay to it. Um, cause that way you don't have to fight the computer. Um, uh, well, while you're working on it, you can you can set it and forget it type thing. Next question. 
uh, comes from Keenan Campbell of Princeton, Illinois. And I have to get that right. Kudos to office hours. I'm helping with a hybrid event next week and needed a hyper deck. No stock anywhere. Thanks to Guy and Cam uh, Carmi. I now have a used one here and a loner one. Bravo office hours for helping the little guy from Princeton, Illinois, not New Jersey. But <laughs> I'm sorry. Boom. Yeah. If you don't put a state though, I'm going to often mess up because there are a lot of Princetons. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks for everybody for uh, stepping up and, and, and helping them out. That's it's, it's an interesting community we've built up here, uh, making every, everything work. All right, next question. Uh, Will DeWilt, DeWitt, I'm sorry, of Charles, Charleston, South Carolina, is anyone aware of security issues using flash-based or end-of-life Crestron devices? Note I'm higher ed and trying to show why we need to upgrade some of our aging presentation rooms. <laughs> well, Adobe got rid of Flash. It doesn't even, like, Adobe's not even supporting it anymore. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's like, there's nothing like, it's gone. <laughs> like there's, I'm surprised that it's still running. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of problems. I mean, you know, there there are because it's not being supported. There's all kinds of security. If you're a school, I mean, th there's security problems. There's uh, you know performance problems. Uh, at some point, people have to start valuing time, people's time. You know, when people don't upgrade their hardware, especially for that long, it just shows a disrespect for people's time because you're going to spend all this time trying to make it work. Um, and so that's. <laughs> that, that that's what i would say um, next question we'll do it. it says uh back from charleston again jumping off uh brian carpenter's question any suggestions for a lower cost version of something like the stem audio table thinking of using it in giving uh to improve vip audio for virtual events stem audio is not capitalized so just stem audio table i i don't i don't know what that is um you've stumped us We'll have to keep moving and since we're running out of time we're gonna just keep moving uh, next question alan tyson las vegas absolutely new to video world any suggestions on building a home green screen um yeah i mean the make sure you have enough space <laughs> is the number one thing um you'll think you see a lot of people do it right in front of their green screen i wouldn't recommend that uh, i would do a physical background if i can't get enough distance to the background uh, and when i say distance i would say i i consider four feet to be the, the closest i will get to a green screen like i just won't so then you need another four to six feet for the camera so you need the minimum depth for a for a, a something that i would use is like 10 feet um, and, and that's using up the whole thing. And I would really prefer 15 for the throw um, because you want to move as far away from that green screen as possible because you want to light the green screen separately from the foreground. So you, you want to light yourself separately. And this is assuming that you're not going to, all the way to the feet, which I would recommend against. If you're building one in your home, never go below your knees, you know, or just below your knees, never go to your feet because that creates a whole new set of problems that you don't have to deal with if you just don't do that. Um, and so those would be the things that I would think about. And I build a grid. Uh, in the in the ceiling grids are your friend when it comes to green screens you just hang everything from the ceiling um and uh so those would be the, the major things um to do uh kina flows four foot kina flows just a two by are easily acquired in a ebay now and provide a nice large wash and then you can consider green green bulbs at that point if you can flag them off uh, go ahead carl and then jeffrey real quick if you're doing pre-recording, maybe not going live, even if you are going live, you can put the camera out in the hallway. So put the camera out in the outside the room via the door with a longer lens, like 85, 135. Um, that'll shoot through the door. It'll allow you to use a smaller green screen because it's going to see less behind you and allows you to get away from the green screen, as I said. But don't be afraid to put the camera outside the room and shoot into the room if you need that extra distance. And if you're doing it all the time, the main thing is making sure that you can actually just walk in and turn it on. But if you, if you don't have that space, Carl's uh, suggestion is great. Go ahead, Jeffrey, uh, real quick, and then we'll move on. We're running over. Painting painting will always give scuffs. I have a pull-down one, but if you get a pull-down one, don't do the spring-loaded one because it could just pop up at any time. It's That's happened to me. I actually changed it to a corded, uh, so I pull it down using the cord and back up. Yep, yep. Uh, next question. Abraham in San Diego, I'm looking for small mics like the Rode Mic Go. Is there other, are there any other options you recommend? small well the road might go i guess is a small wireless option um yeah go ahead mickey real quick yeah the the road go is one of those um road video might go as one of those uh small mics that you mount on the it's usually marketed towards the dslr crowd 
Um, if you're talking about something around the same price range, I would probably recommend the Rode uh, NTG, what's the name of it? Sorry. Uh, the video mic NTG, um, because it has an active uh, amplifier circuitry in it. So it's, it sounds a lot cleaner than any of the more, uh, the lower end ones. Plus it can also act directly as an interface into a computer via USB. Next question, we're gonna move really fast. Alex Golner in London says, what's the panel's take on the Twitter version of Clubhouse, Twitter Spaces, their acquisition of a service that handles content from behind many paywalls and a recent ability to tip selected Twitter creators? It might be a better solution than Clubhouse, uh, I still think that, comp, you know, figuring out how to do the conversation is the part that everyone hasn't really quite got their head around yet. But um, so Twitter doesn't help. And Twitter is just a really difficult platform to maintain anything meaningful. Um, next question. Paul Vallis of Austin, Texas. Uh, Lex Friedman talks a lot about smart contracts using blockchain. Chain. Will these help us in or audio and video biz in our audio or video business dealings? Trust and relationships is the most important part of a contract. <laughs> like there's no amount of anything that will help you <laughs> beyond trust. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, you can, you can try, I mean, I think that it's interesting and, and you can definitely work on it, but I think that uh, if you don't trust the person you're working with, don't do it. You know, like it's, you know, that's the, um, and I usually try to, I try as best I can to do small projects first with them to see how they, how they are before we get into large ones. But, but I, I think the blockchain is interesting for that. I think it's, and, and in mass and in generalization, it could work well. Like you have to make a whole bunch of contracts with lots of individuals that you're not having, it's a transactional relationship and not a real production relationship. I think that it could could make a big difference. I've got some, yeah, I've, we've thought about that a little bit. Next question. Oh, okay. Uh, Shannon, Shannon Cooper of San Francisco. Uh, what's the best cost-effective solution to get a wireless IFB from a computer? We'll give Shannon a minute or two. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey best and cost effective um yeah uh probably on the on the more affordable side of things i would recommend what uh what madeline's been using and also what the mount used which is the road wireless go to system make sure it's version two and not one yeah and we were we, shannon and we were talking about we're trying to find a another version of that because the road is a little low on on volume right i mean that's one of the the challenges go ahead mickey um, yeah, there are also, if, if Shannon's willing to go secondhand, uh, you, you might want to consider looking at the secondhand market for Comtex, those that run on the VHF uh, system, not UHF. VHF mm -hmm. is so much easier to, uh, to uh, coordinate wirelessly because you're fighting less things. And also the range compared to the UHF system is much, much longer. So super quick, 10 seconds each, uh, Jeffrey, Jesse, and Carl. I've been uh, getting a bunch of knockoffs, road knockoffs to do reviews. And the one of the things I've been testing is, can be, they be used for IFB? So once I find something, I'll definitely uh, shoot you guys a message. Great, Jesse? Older generation Sennheiser, um, you know, IFB, like a G3, but you wanna get it in a band that works in the Bay Area, which is um, band A. Very good, uh, Carl? So a cheap way of using uh, loopback into, um with auto ducking into AirPods. There you go, that good guy. Yeah, the Rode Wireless Go 2. The thing to uh, keep in mind is the impedance of the earbuds that you use. If you get something too big, it's just gonna soak it all up and that results in the lower level. So if you use uh, high efficiency um, um, in your monitors, they can get that loudness that you're looking for. Otherwise, Electrosonics Duet M2 with Dante, you know? <laughs> what kind of budget? What's Exactly. What, what's cost effective to you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it means exactly. something different to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question. Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. Alex mentioned LIDAR. What do you do with it and which applications make the best use of it? Um, Polycam is, is probably my favorite one at the moment uh, just because it it is uh, you can gather 3D information you can use for measurements and so on and so forth. Uh, go ahead, Carl. So if you use portrait mode on the iPhone, just vanilla portrait mode, um, Pixelmator Pro on the Mac will now support that as a layer. So you can just get rid of it and change it. Like that's just built in. No, no oh, playing around, just instantly delete amazing. that layer or replace it. Amazing. Yeah, the uh, we're getting pretty close to being able to generate models. And I think that what we're going to see hopefully in the next couple months is the idea of being able to take photographs as well as LiDAR. So you have structured light and unstructured light all at the same time. This would allow us to have the accuracy of LiDAR with the detail of photogrammetry. Um, we can see 
hints of that in polycam where it's showing you where all the photos are it shows you a little trail so you, you know that it knows where those photos are um and i think that that's going to be the next uh next thing um uh, next question comes from Abraham in San Diego. And he says, I'm looking for a new iPad Pro case so that when my new iPad Pro arrives, any recommendations? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I, this is one of those things for me. I have like six different cases for my iPad Pro of a previous generation. If I'm on the road, I want the one with the keyboard built in because it works perfectly. And it is the Apple one that attaches physically, not through Bluetooth. So I don't have to mess with that. But in other circumstances, if I'm taking it out, I want sometimes uh, in the field a back strap and I use some of those bigger, mm. more robust cases. I just find I resuit my iPad a bunch depending on the circumstance I'm going to use it in. Go, go ahead, Guy, real quick. This is the uh, keyboard that it or that it does not come with that has the magic. I, I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's amazing. As a, as a case, I wouldn't say it's as protective as some of those military otter box type ones, but for practicality, this is what I carry around everywhere because it's, it's yeah. just amazing being able to lift it up and then, of course, get the Apple Pencil if you can because that's amazing too. That's what I'm getting <laughs> is that keyboard. <laughs> so that's Plus the, one on the pencil. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's useful. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same one as the last one, so you don't have to – you can move it from one to the other if you needed to. I don't think they – there's no Pencil 3 yet. I don't think there's just Pencil 2. Um, next, uh, Now we are shifting gears to networking. Uh, a lot of us have been uh, – a lot of us are deep in networking <laughs> at this point. Uh, the, the, the market has changed pretty dramatically as far as how that works. And so, uh, and, and at this point, I don't know, well, for the last five years, I haven't really built very many kits that don't have the ability to network. Uh, we're experimenting heavily in doing this in production with Mad in the Kitchen, where uh, every week we're having more and more people logging in from somewhere else to, to manage that process. So we thought it'd be appropriate. And then of course, AWS, all this becomes important. And so we thought it'd be appropriate to um, answer some questions and the questions have stacked up. So I don't think we need a lot of introduction. I think all we need to do is start jumping into it. So um, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Okay, first one, Jesse Mills, San Francisco Bay Area. What are the primary VLAN setup considerations? Wait a second, my mouse is in the wrong place. I want to highlight it so I don't get off track here. Okay, there we go. Uh, what are the primary VLAN setup considerations when creating separate VLANs for management, NDI, and Dante? Um, I will usually separate all of those things out from each other. So I, I usually want to put everybody in a lane. So um, the other thing to think about is uh, public versus um, staff. So a lot of times I'll give the public, you know, a public wa you know, um, a public access point its own VLAN so that I don't have to, so that they're not um, impinging on on what we're doing, and it also keeps them secure and away from what our traffic. Then you have a staff management traffic uh, that's there. Then streaming traffic. Then NDI. Then oh, I don't do as much NDI, but any kind of video um, pieces that we need, and then. Uh, Dante. And so I'll create lanes for all of those things um, to make sure that they're not stepping on each other um, and, and they stay in their lane, so to speak. JJ? DHCP pools for each of those. So yeah. uh, as you separate out your traffic into different um, VLANs, it is wise to uh, uh, to make sure that your DHCP pool is not similar to what someone might connect to later on with a VPN tunnel. So if they connect and they have a 10.00x network at home, use something that's weird. So 172.16 or 172.32, something in that that range, which is still is, is a slash 24. Or if, here's the other thing to add on to that. Your DHCP pool, if you have enough units within that, you might want to increase that from a slash 24 to a slash 23, meaning instead of 256 addresses, you have 512 addresses for the amount of devices you have inside your environment. Um, and then finally to that, make sure the DHCP server will support that because not all servers will support a larger size uh, pool. So if you have a Windows box that's running your AD environment and you have DHCP running on that, make sure that you can actually increase to a 23 or a 22 if it comes on later on. Go ahead, Mickey. The end. Uh, yeah, um, I, I like separate, separating the VLAN IDs by tens. So instead of just doing VLAN ID 1, 2, 3, 4, I do it at 10, VLAN ID 10, 20, 30, so that if in the future I need to expand a specific uh, protocol with something like similar, like if I, if I put Dante in VLAN 60 and I have to put another uh, Dante network but separated uh, into, the, into the network, I can put it at VLAN 61 so that I, I, I have things sort of 
more uh, organized. And also um, be very familiar with all the ports for the protocols that protocols that you need to tunnel between the different VLANs because you you will have to punch in a, a port forwarding to get the the like say Dante audio to a specific uh, machine by that isn't on the same VLAN. Next question comes from Ken Jordan in Surrey, the UK. He says, my internet modem only has four ports. So I'm using a couple of TP-Link TLSG108S8 port switches. Is this the best way to expand my ports? And he notes, I'm wanting a more pro solution as looking to have ethernet connections throughout the house. All right, go ahead, John. So I use that same, well, a similar switch. I use the one without the S at home and it works fairly well, but it's not a pro solution. A pro solution would be a managed switch, uh, something from like Cisco or, or something along those lines. Those cost a lot more money though. We're talking uh, several thousand dollars to start. So um, I I, I'm happy with the TP-Link for the price. Mm -hmm. I go ahead, Aaron, and then JJ. Uh, it depends on what you want to do, but if you're just wanting to plug in things, that's totally a fine thing. If you want to add VLANs and a bunch of other stuff, you do need a managed switch. I use Ubiquiti switches at home. They work fine. Um, they don't need to be high-end. You can Netgear makes some, you know, you, you could do VLANs on just about any managed switch, but uh, if you're just plugging things in, any old dumb switch is fine. Yeah, you don't need to get too special. Go ahead, JJ. FS.com has some sub thousand dollar switches that are managed switches that are really great. The the important consideration when you have multiple switches inside of an environment is the spanning tree map that you have can be overwritten. So the VLANs that you have on on your primary switch, your core switch. Can, could possibly have that same VLAN database overwritten by another switch further down the line if it's a managed switch. So make sure that as you connect multiple switches, you also have spanning tree configured correctly on each of those ports and that they're configured as uh, trunk ports rather than access ports so you don't accidentally write over your VLAN database as can happen in many data centers. I've seen it happen. <laughs> Mickey? And yeah, based off, based off of uh, Ken's question, it seems like his modem is not only uh, acting as a modem, but it's also taking on routing and NAT uh, duties as well. So first thing I would do is get a totally separate uh, router to handle that separately and uh, set the modem to bridge mode. The uh, uh, many IT professionals that I work with that are doing it at home, they may not use Ubiquity at work. They may have a Cisco or Meraki or something, but Ubiquity is what a lot of them put into their house. So if you're looking for that kind of pro solution, but not as expensive as some of the other solutions, uh, Ubiquity seems to be a very, very popular. Um, our good friend that has done a bunch of networking here, uh, Aaron Mailer, uh, who does some pretty high-end uh, networking and has basically spent, I don't know, 10 years working in Meraki. I think I believe that when he built it at home, <laughs> built it with the Ubiquity network. So, so it's something to take a look at. Um, next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles. For my home setup, I have a Ubiquiti 16 port managed switch plugged into a Spectrum provided router. Is there anything else that should be added or replaced in this mix? I'm running an ATEM, uh, running ATEM switchers, laptops, HyperDeck minis, PlayOut, BN streaming bridge. Uh, go ahead, John. Uh, from a security standpoint, I'm not happy with DNS or ISP provided routers. And I would, uh, in my home, for instance, for instance, I've got an AT&T router in between it and my home network, I've got a Asus router that is providing my network uh, interface. So just from a security standpoint, uh, if there's a compromise at uh, your ISP, you don't want that leaked password to compromise your home network. And if you have your own router, you can do that on security yourself. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. And Spectrum has locked down all of their routers <clears throat> that they're sending out now, so I would suggest getting your own Doxis, Netgear, or, uh, you know, cable, cable modem, and your own uh, router. Because also Spectrum has a tendency to steal your bandwidth and offer it to the public as hotspots uh, on their routers. As does Comcast. 
yeah most most of the ISPs do so you got to be careful about that but if you have your own router uh, you can not do that and they've locked it down so much you can't even go in and do port forwarding or anything on it yourself on their routers yeah go ahead Bill yeah I had the same problem I got fiber from AT&T and they provide the router and they don't let you have any access I have to use their password their router and everything or I don't get an act back from the central office and I don't get the feed Generally, the first thing I do when I get <laughs> when I get a service is I get rid of the modem that they gave me. With fi with the AT and T fiber, I don't think Bill had that choice. With Comcast, you do, and so the very first thing I do is get rid of. And spe Spectrum, I know you do as well. Uh, uh, we definitely have seen people have more reliable service with Spectrum. There's something they're doing in those modems that is um, spreading um, spreading the the load. And they're doing something where they're they're when they get hammered, they're pushing everybody down. And by getting out of that network, they don't they don't like it. But you can do that, and then you're you're not getting as much. Uh, they can still do that with Doxis, but they but we don't see it happen as often. You know, next question. Uh, moving on to Guy Cochran in Seattle. How do you connect NDI from one VPC to another VPC in the same AWS data set data center? Now go ahead, Aaron. You set up these. VPC peering between the two VPCs. Um, and the cost is the same as if you were doing interzone transfers. So, but it works fine. There you go. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Guy. I'm waiting for uh, my buddy here, Jim, to fire something up. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand, Jim. Uh, you're uh, quieter than we expected, Jim. Yep, sorry. We were a couple minutes out. A uh, guy uh, pinged me and said, "Hey, can we uh, show this?" And we didn't have any instances running, so I'm just trying to do a quick demo, and I'm working with uh, Jonas on it. So perhaps we could come back to it in a couple minutes. Yeah, let's save that question. So we'll um, we'll cancel that and push it back and go to the next question. Fair enough. Brian Carpenter in Cleveland, Ohio said, "What's the best structured progression teaching service to learn networking from beginner toward expert? Plural site, YouTube channel, book." Uh, paid or free as a 50 plus adult and my 17 year old son, we both want to learn. Uh, go ahead, John. So I get LinkedIn learning through work and I found it to be a pretty decent service. Um, I would say more don't look at the service so much as look at what your goals are for networking. Uh, a Network Plus certificate is a good place to start to get familiarity with networking. Uh, but uh, LinkedIn learning, which used to be Linda, uh, dot com is a really excellent place to start. Carl. So I find that study.com is pretty good if you're trying to learn something for the first time. Um, they used to be called education portal, but now they're called study.com. Um, very cheap. You can do a lot of it for free as well. So it's a lot of, you can try a lot of it for free. Yeah, go ahead, JJ. CBT nuggets. Uh, it, I, I think it's unbeatable personally because of the, not just the breadth of the experience, of the folks that are there, but also the way that which you learn and the different kinds of things that you can learn that are not just re networking related, but like project management, ITIL coordination, it's all inside CBT Nuggets and it's a great price. It's a month by month basis. And I've said this before, but I think it's, I'm surprised with like LinkedIn learning and so on and so forth. They don't add using LinkedIn live, <laughs> live conversations because the, the non, the, the ASIN, you know, um, asynchronous training mixed with synchronous would be super useful. Next question. Mark Hadley in Seattle is up next and wants to talk IPv6 and wonders, is it worth taking the time to configure and does it provide improved security? Go ahead, John. Uh, I don't think security is any more improved uh, over the network protocol. Um, and I don't think it's worth time to configure at this particular point in time because nobody else is really using it. Go ahead, Aaron. So I've had IPv6 for five years. Um, there, there's no real security benefit, but um, it is the way of the future. Um, all of my Someday. machines have, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, we're out of IPv4. So um, it, it doesn't hurt to configure it. And every machine has a, a real IP address now, which is nice. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, I agree. I, I think it's it's always like I I did a live stream in two thousand eight about IPv six and how you know and it was a couple of years yeah. away. So well, I was on I was working in ITF when it was first ratified. So yeah. I mean in yeah. ninety nine uh, no two thousand I guess two 
2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. No. Next question. Vincent Alvarez in Bellingham, Washington. Our county government office is moving. How do I ask for an internet line to the building? What terminology do I use? It may be a rural area. A university will be our ISP, but what do I need to have to the building? A fiber drop, a something cable? What should he ask for? Go ahead, John. Yeah, if you want a fiber line, you you can ask for a fiber line or a fiber drop and uh, get it to your office that way. Um, you just don't get too technical with them, uh, unless you know exactly what your requirements are, because they'll be able to provide that detail as the ISP. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. Um, also if you're only getting one line in, try to get two lines in or two different types of lines in. So fiber and maybe microwave as a backup. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Fiber and microwave are, are a great way to make sure that you're going back to that if you have line of sight or if you can make that actually work. Um, getting both of those in there just means that if one gets cut, you still have it. I would also recommend thinking about a second ISP. Um, you know, it, if you're trying to do something that's mission critical, you want to have another, and that could be cellular. Like it doesn't have to be a, uh, you know, another thing, but if, if you're mission critical, having a cellular setup that's going to be some nominal cost can really mean that you at least have basic communications if, if you lose it. You will, especially with a, a non like I, true ISP, you, you will lose connectivity at some point. And so it's just a matter of, it's not if or but, it'll be when. Um, and so you want to have some kind of backup. We lose it here. I've lost Comcast that way. Um, go ahead, John. Yeah, one other thing to keep in mind is how many uh, users you're going to have at your site, how many connections, how many endpoints. Uh, are you going to be using voice over IP for your telephony? All of that's going to be taken into consideration the amount of bandwidth you need, and that's going to determine the size of the pipe that you need. So once you know that, you can go to the ISP and say, I need this. You'll probably need multiple fiber lines in order to get that coverage. Uh, so just a heads up on that. Yep. And um, yeah, the, I would consider a piece of glass, a, a strand of glass is the minimum <laughs> to, to enter into it. Uh, and you know, for, for me, when I run things, I just run DAC 12. When I just go like, you know, I just want 12 lines, even if they're all together, uh, just because if one gets you, 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 we've had situations where one goes bad or gets cracked or whatever, and the other ones are available. And, and it's just, if they're going to go through that run, just, just run them all. It's not that it used to be really expensive. And it's just not anymore. Um, next question. Tony Mobley in Newman, Georgia says, as an NDI novice, can the panel share an overview for other newbies watching office hours? Basically, he's asking, what is NDI? Uh, go ahead, uh, Aaron. So NDI is a video stream that gets brought, uh, can be sent from point to point or multicast on a network. And then uh, multicast being anybody who's listening can hear it, which also eats up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, it, is, it is compressed to work within a gigabit ethernet network. Uh, NDI HX is its sort of cousin, which then uses uh, higher compression to let it work over things like Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. um, the um, and the discovery of the streams is using uh, Bonjour or Rendezvous, whichever we want to call it, uh, which is or multicast DNS, uh, which advertises the streams uh, out to the world so you can listen to them. That's great. Okay. And it was invented by uh, uh, New Tech, which right. is now part of VizRT. Yeah. Okay. The video toaster. Oh, I didn't people. raise my hand, but uh, oh, I, yeah, thought you I mean, as a, in, in my as imagination, a novice knowing in, tone, in, <laughs> in your imagination, I raised my hand. Yeah. Uh, I mean, great answer, Aaron. Uh, yeah, we're using it uh, in a number of ways with devices like um, I've got this little block camera from Lumens. Uh, there's some PTZ cameras, like Aaron said, there's some uh, you know, iPhone apps that you can use to do wireless NDI. So the benefits are you, know, you can do multiple streams of video and audio and have things like um, on a Mac, you can have Mimo Live pick it up and you can cut those streams and add graphics over the top and then spit it back out as a stream to you know, YouTube or something like that. So a lot of people are using NDI in, term, in, in place of HDMI or SDI to transport video from a camera or from an edit station. In our case, which if the guys are ready to fire up the, um, in a few moments, we'll see 
that <laughs> Jonas is nodding his head. But basically what I want to be able to do is let's say we have Matt in the kitchen and we want to have other people edit it. Like uh, we want to take the feeds up, but then we want to spit them back out to somebody else who's not on our account. So this peering that Aaron was talking about, we'll be able to send up one stream, but then push it out to let's say 10 other people and they could do let's say a different language, like maybe they're doing graphics for Mexico or, or you know, uh, France or something like that. So there's a number of reasons why you want to use NDI um, routing. You know, it just makes tossing around video in infrastructures or in the cloud easier. And so... So uh, what are you going to cut them at in the kitchen in the cloud? And that's my question. Well, we, we could start... I mean, the first step is for us to start putting instances inside of your room. So basically, we just need to drop in another... So. The way that we do it is we'll we'll take one instance, the G4DN, and we'll install Zoom on it, and we'll we'll put that in there, and we'll screen we'll do dual monitors, we'll screen scrape, and using NDI, we'll take that screen scrape of the isolated image, let's say it's Madeline, and we'll push it over to a cutting station, which in this case might be live stream or it might be uh, vMix or something like that, uh, Wirecast, any of these other cutting machines. I, I'd love to be able to let people learn how to cut by saying use whatever you want we'll supply the feed so like in my highest dream like a lot of people are just learning how to cut and we're giving them you know some bumpers and some guardrails for them to play in but if they blow it up like let's say they stream out mad in the kitchen on their own facebook to their friends just to say look i'm cutting this show i'm adding the graphics look at the graphics and and then they can blow it up on in a safe environment but then when they go to do their real show they know the basics they know how to add graphics they know who they can count on to uh to help them out, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see like who's good at graphics, who's good at audio. Uh, somebody for, for now, I just I'd love to see just the basic production in, in the cloud. Like I'd I'd love to see how that works. I mean, it, whenever you guys are ready, we would love to um, have you test that. You know, just just set it up and start cutting and see, seeing how it works. Where, where does the, where does the branding question come in to that? Because Madeline's brand now is being spread out by Madeline, anybody and everybody so madeline's would might not be the best solution for that but a show would be yes. a good solution so so a I'll, you know we could set up some yeah. kind of cooking show where we put a bunch of stuff into, into the cloud and then and then someone could everyone could cut it i think that you'd end up in a kind idea. of TikTok world saying i'm running a show and i'm going to put a bunch of raw feeds up and everyone edits the one that they want um with with graphics and that could be a really inter interesting social experiment probably for uh for a managed brand would probably be less exciting um but but for um but you could they could add bumpers and things and graphics and slow-mo and replay and all kinds of other things that they wanted to do you know with that and and just experiment with it i think that that would be really interesting um but yeah guy we're ready to um have you experiment with that any at any moment uh, go ahead got doug so most of you know i own a 20-foot production truck um before I had a truck, I was a new tech um, customer. So I owned a 460 and now I own a TC1. I cannot get away from using NDI because the TC1 only has four physical inputs, although the switcher has 16 total. So I have to use NDI for everything else besides the first four. And I will, by experience only, and I just share this and, and you can take my opinion for what it is, is that I don't trust anything that is crucial to go NDI. I have been burned so many times in productions on, on relying on camera feeds coming back to the truck um, that during a show that just for, for whatever reason, just magically stops working. Um, so with that said, I have more black magic gear in the truck so that the TC one doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And, um, it, it, it it's be, be wary of how you use NDI. NDI is great. And I mean, I used it last night for, we did a little dance show and for the client, um, to view the show, I just put a laptop and plug in the network and there it was but that was a non-critical part of the show you know they got to see it and and if it drops a frame or, or if it goes out for a second that's not crucial but all of our cameras they were coming back in on fiber and sdi so just just be wary of ndi because 
it's a great protocol, but if, if you were in a critical production, like if your stuff is on TV or, or that which sometimes our, our productions are, um, just be leery of, of how you use and where you use the NDI, even though it's a great technology. Um, I just know from experience that it has bitten me many times. Next question. Comes from Talak Lopez Waterman. Um, does Alex have a database of hotels that have internet that you can plug into copper? Seems like gold info in my world. I used to. The problem is it's changed so much. So we used to know pretty, we were used, used to be very clear of what hotels um, had wired and we would recommend them for shows because that's why we always knew. So the ones that you are absolutely, well, when I was doing a lot on the road, uh, the ones that you were sure of were the Four Seasons and Mandarin. Um, those ones tend to, for a variety of reasons, have um, uh, and the Serena in in Africa um, will have wired connections available in in, in rooms and and so on and so forth. After that, uh, it started to you had to really pay attention to um, to after those changed, you had to pay a lot of attention to what they had them. Um, the yeah. So uh, generally, most of them move for Wi-Fi. And the problem is you can't look at it on hotels.com or on their even their website. I had one in Italy, I think I talked about in the past that they uh, they said that they had wired is why I picked their hotel. It's a real, it was a really nice hotel and rainy time in Rome. So it didn't matter. I mean, it wasn't very expensive, but I, I got there and there was no no Ethernet. And they were like, oh, we got rid of that a year ago. We just haven't updated the website. You're just like banging your head. So that's the that's the challenge you get into. Um, I do think that uh, I do think that hotels are going to have to rethink a bunch of things, at least for a handful of rooms that they can charge extra for. Like, I think that there's an opportunity for hotels to build basically video conference ready rooms that they could charge an extra 15 or $20 for a night. Um, maybe even for a person like me, I'd pay, if, if it came with the bandwidth, I'd pay 50 bucks a, a night more to know that the, that the room has ethernet, has Fast, e fast internet connection has a background that is appropriate for video conferencing, you know, which means that there's no bed, there's no window, there's, you know, it's it's got some distance between it. There's a whole bunch of things that I think they could do. To t I was trying to figure out, like, how are they going to do this? Well, they could just take certain rooms that make the most sense, dress them up a little bit, give them ethernet. A lot of them still have ethernet, they just haven't been activated, and then charge more for them. <laughs> you know, then there's people who would pay for that. And so I think that that is a... Um, you know, it's it's an, it's going to be an interesting opportunity because I think more and more people are going to be frustrated with quality of hotel internet is very bad in most places, um, and there's a lot of people that would prioritize that if they knew it was there. It'd be a good advertising campaign, Carl. So I know in Australia, um, all the capital cities have what's called a press junket media suites in hotels because a lot of actors will fly into Australia for one week to promote them, moving them fly out, out to Asia to do the next leg. Um, because of that, all the hotels have these media suites. So you can just call up the hotel, ask concierge, hey, do you have a media suite? That's great. Yeah. I don't, I don't actually don't know if I've never had to do that, but the conference rooms obviously all have them, um, you know, because we usually acquire them. And, and again, I think that the, of all the hotels, as you would guess, the, Four Seasons is the best managed. <laughs> like you just know everything's going to work in Hilton. Not so much. Anyway, next question. Uh, I pulled back, guys, because it looked like the team was ready, if I'm correct about this, and nobody... Uh, yeah, good. So it looks like we're set. Guy asked, how do you connect NDI from one VPC to another VPC in the same AWS data center? Take it away, guys. Ready? Ready to grab that. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so so we unfortunately won't be able to get to the demo part of it today, but uh, uh, Guy, uh, uh, myself, and Jonas uh, did successfully do this uh, to include cross-account VPC peering. So essentially, uh, I uh, uh, peered to uh, uh, to Guy's account, uh, and we made sure that we were within the same region uh, because you do need to watch for that to. Uh, reduce the cost because uh, you'll you'll end up paying for the inter-region tra transfer costs versus just the uh, uh, inter-AZ cost. Um, and and the inter-AZ is pretty low, isn't it? I mean, it's... Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like a... I think it's... Fractions of a cent. Gig yeah. Provide or something like that. But anyway, uh, not not nothing, but, uh, but affordable, very affordable. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, yeah, the other thing you need to watch out for for uh, with VPC peering is uh, overlapping IP space. So make sure that you don't have overlapping IP space. Um, so that's that's one method. Can you describe uh, what overlapping IP space means? Yeah, so the same address space on both sides, the same IP address space on both sides. So if mm -hmm. you try to connect it, it will uh, it will fail. It will not work. <laughs> um, but but if you um, do have a, a need to do that, there are other methods. Uh, one would be uh, 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 VPC, uh, was it called a private link? Uh, essentially, that's where it, you could be a, a hosting provider to provide a service. You put a network uh, load balancer in front of the service with which you, you want to share to another uh, party, and then you essentially uh, 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 publish that that information, which then can be consumed from another account, um, and the other account will end up having a elastic network interface dropped into their subnet, and it will be as if they are talking locally on their own uh, network to a service that's uh, magically uh, being routed across uh, Amazon's network to the other side. Um, and there's some restrictions on that as far as uh, traffic flows go, uh, but that's another way. And, and that gets rid of the overlapping IP space uh, concerns, also more scalable. So That's great. Right, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, the reality, I mean, Jim talks very technical. It's, the reality is he was able to connect to me and I was able to feed him NDI from an outside account. He's coming into mine. I'm sending stuff back and forth. So no longer do I have to worry about opening up my door to an outsider, um, well, for the stream only, but I wouldn't like put them on my account, so to speak, you know, like that'd be super dangerous if they stream something that I didn't want. But if I'm just sending them out a feed and they can take it and do what they want with it, that's that's just amazing. So to see it working in reality, like these two just set it up and then, ping me on discord and they're like hey check this out i'm like what right. you got it working you know it's right. it's just amazing to see that you know this stuff it, you can dream it up but then when you see it in reality it's like wow like that's that's crazy that we can you know have this kind of horsepower um for cheap dollar fifty yeah. dollar twenty five an hour it's nuts. absolutely um aaron and then base you real quick just note that when you do vpc peering you're <clears throat> you have access to the whole vpc so make sure your security groups are set up and use ACLs if you ACL uh, access access control lists if uh, if you need to as well, just to make sure you're not leaking data all over the place. Yep. Go ahead, Bashu. Yeah, guy, are you guys getting full speed access, or are you getting higher than gigabit speeds between the VPCs, or is it limited to gigabit? Can you connect those two up? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so on the uh, the VPC peering, you're not uh, limited. Uh, if you use something like a transit gateway, you are limited to 50 gigabits per second. Uh, and Aaron's correct on the on the security groups. Uh, you know, if you're peering, you know, you're essentially connecting to you know uh, two networks together, and and so the only thing that's uh, available to you at that point is the security groups, which of course you have at your uh, disposal. Um, the private link method is more secure from the application service provider perspective, um, um, uh, you know, because essentially you're you're putting everything behind a network load balancer and you're uh, you're controlling the flows uh, that way. It's also safer for the the, the consumer uh, because the uh, the traffic is only return traffic, so the you know the consuming party is requesting and getting a response. Uh, the the service provider can't uh, start a flow and, and go into your network, so. Next question comes from Rupert McRae of Dallas, Texas. And he said, what secret weapons or superpowers do you have in your network troubleshooting arsenal? Yeah, go ahead, John. Wireshark has been a really useful tool for packet captures. And I also like uh, Traceroute, uh, which tells me where the connection's failing. Those are between that, you know, Wireshark and ping, that's usually all I need to solve an issue. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, um, Link Scout. I just can't think of who made um, who make Fluke. I think doesn't Fluke make it? It's the I carry that around in my backpack. <laughs> you plug it in, and you're able to see everything that you're connected to all the way through. I uh, just don't put it in a secure network. People get really upset, <laughs> so so that, that that you're that you're bouncing through their network. Um, but it's 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 useful to see what's going on. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, um, a simple uh, continuity tester and prober, um, mm -hmm. and then a a very a reliable crimper, a reliable punch down tool with a 
backup blade and a little block of wood to punch against if you're in a a place where uh you have probably nice painted walls and such where you need to make sure you don't scratch up that's great that's great there's the <laughs> most practical answer we've had on any question in the last yeah year. yeah today yeah next question uh todd reynolds north adams massachusetts says my cable guy mentioned something about upcoming synchronous upload download speeds a la fiber but on cable lines with doxis equipment anyone else know anything about this it's probably possible i mean there's not really any reason why they can't do that um you know as far that's not the connections capable of it it's, it's them opening it up and allowing you to have it uh, go ahead aaron and then and then mickey so Doxis 3 only provides for, I think, four upstream uh, channels, whereas they provide for eight downstream channels. There's the next version. I forgot the name of it. They changed the name from Doxis to something else because branding or something. But um, <laughs> it it's supposedly going to allow synchronous gigabit or 940 megabits um, both ways. Um, but... I don't know who's rolling it out or when. Right. Mickey? Yeah, if your ISP is rolling out the fiber to the building or fiber to the curb, uh, they would much more easily be able to do synchronous as opposed to having to go all the way back to the to the uh, NOC, the Network Operation Center. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, we, we have this really interesting situation where we, we live up on a hill and we have a, I think it's a state route right at the bottom that which crosses our street. And all the things along that route have fiber, but we cannot get fiber in our area to save our lives. It's all spectrum, it's all cable. So that's that that's kind of why it's interesting to me because I don't think they're ever going to pull fiber up to Can us. you see your neighbor's house? Oh, yeah. Yep. Same. Tell me, tell, t t tell me what, why, why, why do you say that? What am I missing? Well, if your neighbor, like you can get a 10 gig connection to, uh, well, I mean, you can get it easily a one gig, gig connection to 10 miles, pretty, you know, pretty straightforward and a 10 gig connection to a couple miles. Um, you know, I mean, you it's can get it to technically, technically can, to 10 miles, but it's really hard and you'll get weather and other things like that. So you can get, you know, it depends on the size of the dish. I mean, smaller dishes will not get to that speed. You'll get to 50 megs or hundred megs or whatever. But, um, if you know, we've, piggybacked on people's personal connections for events all the time. So I walk up to someone's house, knock on the door and say, I'll pay you $200 if you let me connect for the next week. You know, like, like, you know, like I'll just, you know, just write you a check for 200 bucks. If you let me connect to your thing and all I got to do is put this dish on your roof, you know, and you'd be surprised at how many people will say yes to $200 of, you know, if you, especially if you explain that it's a high, you know, it's this blah, 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 blah. Um, you put some QoS in there and, and, uh, you know, hand them back the stuff. People should probably shouldn't let strangers just go into their network like that, but they do. They do. Sometimes it costs as much as $500. And the reason you do it is because we can't get a fast connection installed fast enough, or we can't, and sometimes it's just the backup connection um, that we have. So we've done that a lot. Um, we throw very, we've thrown various dishes up to, to, to make that work. And, and literally, if I can see it, generally, if I can see it, I can hit it, you know, with, with bandwidth. So, um, so it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your head that, you know, um, uh, I've thought about getting, you know, building a network up here of my neighbors and just getting a really paying a lot of money for a fast, really fast connection to my house and then just managing a network, but haven't gotten around to it yet. Go ahead, Bill. And then JJ. Well, they are coming through because it was about two years ago that AT&T sent out the notices that they were bringing fiber to our neighborhood. And we're on top of a ridge above the eight freeway. So the eight freeways down below us, uh, and all the houses here, they actually mm -hmm. strung fiber to the poles. And uh, so 940 it's just, it's, up and down. It all just comes down to math and population density. Yeah. You know, it's just just how many heads per, per mile of fiber is, is all they're going to think about. What's the install cost? Like, for instance, I talked to a popular ISP here. And for them to bring fiber to our house or to our neighborhood was, you know, an X number of dollars. As soon as they figured out how to make X number of dollars uh, amortize over a couple of years, they would do it. Um, go ahead, JJ. So getting layer two delivered to your property based off of somebody else's facility isn't too difficult. Once you have the 2014 rules for the FCC require that as long as there's some form of transit available, that you're required to give it to someone to use. So if you're instance, if there's level three fiber in the ground or above net fiber in the ground, you're allowed to legally use that and then get a, a the physical connectivity 
attach you to a data center where you can pay for the, la the layer three connectivity, which is your bandwidth. So in the case of if there's fiber nearby, if you can string fiber from your facility to the next facility, or more affordably, Mimosa. Mimosa Networks, they offer a sub $600 point-to-point -point network, which is 1.2 gigs. So it's really easy to get a, a single home solution, as it were, although it's a really business. I've, I've used it in a number of businesses for, um, you know, across like two or three streets because they're, they're the Mimosa Network unlicensed bands are available for less than $600 for the pair and you can configure those very easily to function up to 17 miles. It, uh, you know, you don't need any special training to configure two devices to point at each other, especially if you can see them. Now, the and the word that I ran out on the other day was Fresnel zone. The one thing you have to make sure is that the Fresnel zone uh, is is wide enough, and it's usually 17 degrees for the top and bottom, so that that wave that does this in the sky can do this. So that that's the Fresnel zone that has to be available. Uh, line of sight for a longer distance than let's say three or four miles. Uh, closer distance doesn't matter because you get enough multipaths, multipath bouncing around that you'll actually get a clean signal. You might get some signals out of packets out of order, but that can also be resolved with QoS. And I really wish this weren't right now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Moving on, Todd Reynolds in North Adams, Massachusetts. I keep hearing about mesh. What is the situation on that? I don't really use wireless at this point for much anyway, but is it coming? Uh, go ahead, JJ. So the, the, next, the next version, the next iteration of wireless signal that was used for homes has a higher frequency but lower distance uh, connectivity. But it also means you get a better bandwidth. So all your devices you'll get in a mesh environment of which there are many, like um, the home controller equipment, uh, Zigbee, those are all using mesh. So it's one device connected to another device, connected to another device, connected to another device, and they connect to each other, which creates a mesh. So inter interconnected uh, um, multi-path method of getting from point A to point Z. So you'll have many paths in between, many met methods of getting from one to, to one device to the next device in a mesh fashion. If a single cell within that mesh fails, you can use another path, path to get there. Uh, and use their self-healing because they have multiple mm -hmm. methods of getting from point A to point Z, which is part of the protocol built into mesh. All right, go ahead, David, real quick. We're going to move really fast. Just David. Uh, mesh is you, ubiquitous in uh, ITRON, your electrical systems. Uh, all your meters talk to each other through mesh. And my ubiquity system at home is a mesh network. It's really good for Wi-Fi instead of having to do a star where everybody has to be able to see the other one. Mesh is like hops along so you can get to the end of the house. Um, I have mesh in my house. It's been a disaster. <laughs> so it's a ubiquity part of it. it. It's just that it's, it's much less stable than Wi-Fi, which is much less stable than wired. Uh, I would only use I would only use Wi I would you only use mesh if I had to at this point. I'm I'm about to rip it all out and put in just access points and 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 make them all work. And so uh, just just to say that I have enough Ethernet that I can make that work. Uh, we're gonna have to move pretty quickly. Um, for the folks that are uh, for our panelists. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, it'll, I'll take one or two people from each uh, for each question. If you wait until we start answering it, uh, I probably won't get to you. All right, next question. Aren't air tags a baby mesh though? Anyway, uh, next, moving next question. On. Bo, Bo Cordell, Charleston, South Carolina. Has anyone gone down the path of creating dashboards to monitor network performance? I've tinkered with Promethe Prometheus Grafana stack, but it seems like a deep rabbit hole. Go ahead, John. Uh, we tend to use Splunk in our enterprise to build all of our dashboards out. So they're all custom. Next question. Tim Mann, Langvin, Australia. Is Artnet DMX almost plug and play like Dante? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Carl. It is pretty good. So Artnet is actually quite straightforward. It's as straightforward as Dante, yes. As, as straightforward as Dante, you'd say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Which is not completely lights. straightforward. No, but that's what I mean. It's not complete. It's punching holes for it. That's the thing on, yeah, yeah. punching holes through networks for it is, is one thing you need to learn. But it's as far as that, it's not so bad. Yeah. All right. Aaron, real quick. Yeah. I mean, DMX still requires you to configure node IDs on all, <coughs> all the devices. It's pretty basic. And then Artnet just sort of wraps around DMX. So it's, you still have to configure the DMX, even if you don't have to do much with Artnet. Next question. Dave Kaufman, Vancouver, BC. Does IPv6 mean the end of NAT and this annoying 192.168 pseudo addresses? Go ahead, John. 
eventually, but it may be another decade or, or more before that happens. Right. Uh, however, if you think 192.168 addresses are annoying, wait till you see an IPv6 address. It is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Next question. Dave Kaufman, Vancouver. Again, for those of us who are just Ethernet Wi-Fi users, what's with, use, what's with using um, putting NDI virtual PCs in the cloud? How do you get started? We have some, we did some Fridays where we talked about that. So I, I think I would go back um, to, to look at those. I would at least watch those first and then, and then best thing to do is then try it. We, we probably should set up some labs that we can just, you know, all kind of build stuff together. I think that's the next step for what we were discussing. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, exactly. Go back and watch some of those videos. The, the biggest use case for us is just the resiliency, being able to have something up there where the internet connection is 3000 megabits per second and it's just solid as can be and then the power you know they've got generators and all that stuff so here if, if i get hit you know the, th the show just goes on so if it's like an eight hour play out which i heard somebody had to do with the other day it's like eight hours like yeah i'd rather just do it in the cloud because if somebody hits a telephone pole down by my house the show goes on and it right. doesn't get interrupted so there's lots of reasons why but resiliency bandwidth and then the one that I didn't really think about is the depreciation of your computers. Like up there, you're just paying the buck 25. You're not eating the, you know, Dell 3090 or whatever it is. And the next year, the newest one comes out with an i9 or i11, whatever's next. You just keep paying your buck 25. So there's a lot of great reasons. And if you're using them something. all the time, having hardware is I don't nice. Use them. No, I'm saying if, yeah, if, yeah, if you're, if you're using, using them all the time, all the time sure. hardware is hardware is nice. If you're not using them all the time, then the cloud is nice. Yeah. yeah. Next, next, next question. Dave Kaufman again. Uh, is SNMP still a thing for building network connection maps? Uh, any? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, we don't have a strong answer on that one. It stumped us. Uh, next question. Mike Dean in Arlington. I recently ran into a plugin for Zoom. I think it's only for gallery mode, which for me I wouldn't use. Has anyone tried it to see if other uh, if it offers features? Um, if it offers features. Look, NDI for Teams to allow. So this may be the plugin that he's referring to. Maybe Zoom, uh, um, uh, Zoom ISO or Zoom OSC ISO. Oh, okay. uh, go ahead, Jonas. I think he means uh, there's a plugin where you can make. Uh, the little boxes flowing around in a circle. And right. what he's probably trying to ask if there are something similar to um, Teams NDI, there's not yet. Um, I think Andy is working on a, something like that for Zoom. We expect to see, Andy's been talking about, uh, about that for a little while and we expect to get closer to the surface soon. Uh, next question. Joel Hofford in Tempe, Arizona. Does anyone have experience getting a dark fiber connection to connect two locations together where do you start to see what's available how do you find dark fiber like is there a directory <laughs> yeah, exactly just go down there and cut it and then it's dark um yeah, yeah so the uh it's all dark um you'll know who owns it once you cut the line <laughs> they'll, they'll show up real quick look at the logo ahead, on John. the truck that shows up ask google if you can borrow some of theirs <laughs> that's exactly good mickey yeah, I would want to go to uh, telco companies and ask for a leased line. This would be a dedicated line that they would set up between your two locations. Though there, you pay business uh, rates for that, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question. Tony Mobley, because of office hours, I have Wi-Fi 6, three four-port switches, Ethernet connections at home. I need to replace the switcher that is on my rolling desk. What switcher should I get for the desk? Connected devices include a Raspberry Pi, an ATEM Mini, a Mac Mini, a third-generation Apple TV, all connected on the desk. And he has one gig fiber connection up and down, and he'll be adding a Mac in the future. I would uh, go ahead, John. I was going to say, let me do some research on that for you, Tony, and get back to you because I don't have anything. I'm not in the market right now for a new modem, so I don't have anything off the top of my head. At that point, I'd start thinking about something that has 12 to 16 ports. And I would recommend thinking about something that has a couple of those ports that are PoE. You know, just, just to make sure that you can power things out if you need it. You don't need it yet, but those things um, become useful down the road. There, I, every, I have a, a little switch here that I, I wanted to do Bluetooth to Dante. 
And I was like, what am I going to, oh, now I got to find a POE injector. And then I looked at the switch and there's one little POE on the end. And I was like, oh, I, I need to buy more of these. You know, just to have one that I can just drop a little bit, a little power. And there's POE and then there's POE plus, which was a higher voltage. Um, so uh, anyway, so it's, I, I would recommend getting one with, a, you want considerably more ports than you need right now because it's just a pain to keep on adding them on top of each other so you know thinking you know if, if you have if you need three get eight if you need eight get 16 that type of thing good mickey yeah i, I would uh, get a uh, a switch that has uh, uh, a couple of 10 gigabit ethernet uplink ports uh, because you'd want to you since you have a uh, gigabit in, uh, internet coming into the facility or the house um you you'd want to build for the ability to uh, to uh, feature proof a little bit. And I would go with uh, 10 gigabit ethernet as opposed to fiber, uh, since you mentioned it's a rolling desk. Very good. I think we have one more, one more. Oh, good. Oh, it's just a comment. Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I went with this. I'm hesitant to recommend it because even me, I'm not a super network you know, nerd, but uh, I'm trying to be play one on on office hours. So, but it's like the, these just came in uh, for what Mickey was talking about the five gig. Well, I didn't go with full ten gig. I just went with uh, uh, oh no, I did go with ten gig. But basically, I'm using the Dream Machine, which is like three hundred seventy nine bucks with an eight port switch, two of them, one back in where the wiring closet is. But then I did get these um, SFPs to put in for the ten gig for the high bandwidth stuff, especially as my NDI grows because it it'll saturate a, a, a one gig pretty quick. So I'm hesitant to recommend it though to everybody because it does take some some brains to, uh, and, and so I don't wanna like recommend something that is just gonna be a hassle, but they try to make it simple compared to the old stuff. This is really simple. The UI and stuff in it is, is fantastic. So it, this one doesn't have PoE in the Dream Machine. You have to put it on the switch. So that was one thing that I learned is that even my access points require PoE and uh, so that's that's one option, three seventy nine plus I think two ninety nine for the eight ports. What's the little thing in the package you were holding up? It's an SFP, to, to, so it's a one gig uh, on each um, copper, but then the ten gig. If I start to go over, let's say eight NDI feeds into my computer, I have a five gig um, USB C. So like this little thing right here is a is a. Let me actually fade out of this one. Cut to this one. That. So this is a USB-C to Ethernet 5 gig connection. So as I saturate the 1 gig built in, I'm going to start using this so I can get even more bandwidth. But I'm not going to go full 10 gig out of the laptop because those are really expensive. Those are like 300 bucks. This was like 70 bucks or something like that. So uh, this one's made by um, uh, QNAP. Very good. And I think we had one last comment. Yeah, well, there was a new question came in. So we have one more question than the comment. So Mike Dean says, does anyone uh, have any programming experience with NDI? I'm in school for Python plus Java, and I know NDI is C++ or C Sharp. What would you recommend to get started? And we may have lost Mickey. I, it got really dark and Mickey had his hand up. What happened, Mickey? Yeah, uh, I am all on UPSs right now. Power went out. so well, You only have to last for another 50 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my UPSs can do like 30 minutes, so yeah, we're fine. <laughs> Very good. Go, go ahead, Jonas. Real quick. I would start with like, think about what you want to do and then learn the language you need for that. I found the easiest way to learn programming is have a project that you want to do and then just throw at it till it's done and just try to finish it somehow. And yeah. then you can talk about which language is better and... If you want to do something with NDI, use C Sharp. That's totally fine. Um, go ahead, uh, uh, Aaron, real quick. 10 seconds. The Download the NDI SDK. It has language bindings for all sorts of languages, and you can just play with it. Okay. And uh, last, last couple comments. We'll just go real quick. Okay. Well, the, Mike Dean said hello from Virginia. That was the one before, but there's another one that came in from him. Has anyone tried HDMI fiber cables? And if so, how well does it work? Uh, yeah, go ahead, David, real quick. I use them all the time for our church services, synagogue services. Uh, very reliable, a bit fragile. Make sure you get sourced and just, they're not two ways. So you have to have them one way, but they're fantastic for long runs if you take care of them. Okay. Yeah, these real pro ones that were like, uh, that's a uh, hundred feet off of Amazon. Um, they work great, even carry for the 
ATEMS, the camera control and all that information uh, is transmitted over these cables. You do just need to make sure that the side that says source goes into the camera and the side that says destination goes into the switcher. But this 100-foot 100, 100 one's been fantastic. I use it all the time and it's perfect. That's great. Well, there we go. Got to the end of another one. That was a good. That was a good conversation. I think that we need to do that at least once a month because there's just so much networking that we're dealing with. So, and I think that all of us will keep moving forward in that area. So we'll try to make that kind of a regular thing. Uh, great work by our producers watching and asking questions and driving the conversation forward. Great work by the panelists. A lot of great answers. A lot of great discussion. So uh, well done. Um, tomorrow again, we have education, unreal, and mad in the kitchen. So stay tuned for that. Um, we will. Uh, we'll see you all soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll jump into the post show.